Welcome home worthy. My name is Ruth McKinney and it's so exciting to have you back. Today we're going to be preparing a fabulous Easter brunch. I have all five of my kids home, my dad, my brother, and some family friends. So you get to join us in making all of the ingredients for that. Right now we're heading to the chicken coop where we'll be collecting eggs for the quiche and then later we'll be going into the barn to create a fabulous tablescape. Come join us. I'm Ruth McKinney and this year I'm inviting Homeworthy to join my family for all of our annual highlights at Hillside Farm, our 305 year old farmhouse steeped in history and love. After decades of flipping houses, my husband Bob and I settled here where we raised our five children. And this year you'll join us for holiday gatherings and the upcoming wedding of our daughter, happening right here at Hillside where we welcome your company as we share in the simple pleasures of life at home. I'll offer tips from my book, Hungry for Home, to help infuse your own home with moments of joy, filling home-cooked meals with flavor for the whole family, and of course, decorating with amazing antique finds. So sit back and make yourself at home. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. All right, welcome to the chicken coop. I love, I always told my husband I could live in here. He built it over COVID. The original chicken coop was sliding off the foundation and one night a fox got in, killed all 25 of our chickens. So my husband thought COVID, perfect time, and he rebuilt this masterpiece. He did everything, it's fantastic. So let me show you where the chickens live. We've got about 20 right now. They're inside and outside. So I personally have not named our chickens, but my kids have. So if you ask them at any point, they can tell you their names, which is really fun. What we did when we purchased them is I wanted laying hens and I wanted multicolors for the eggs. Um, and that's what we get. We get some that are blue, some that are a little more green. We'll get some brown eggs and some white eggs. You know what's really fun? Right now, we're so fortunate. They have been molting and I have had to learn what molting means. It's that time, I call it when the girls take a break. Um, they lose a lot of their feathers and they stop laying for a while. They have just started to relay and of course it's Easter time. So we get to be the beneficiary of that. All right, I've got most of the eggs. We have some more up there, but enough to start our quiche. So let's go on up to the house. They're in. They're eating. Oh, here they come. Come on. Here they are. We're going to be doing out of my cookbook which is called hungry for home here's what we're going to be making we're going to be making a fantastic cheese quiche then we're going to make something called the gold rush coffee cake which is beautiful and i promise your family will love it and then we're going to be doing a candied bacon just something a little bit different for easter and a big bowl of berries so 
Here we go, we're gonna start off with the Gold Rush coffee cake. Oftentimes, my kids ask for this coffee cake over a regular cake on their birthdays. That's how much they love it. It's beautiful, it's great for presentation, and here we go. All right, the Gold Rush coffee cake, here's a picture of it. You can see it in the cookbook. It's on page 111. I had a coffee cake at a restaurant and I loved it so much I came home and looked everywhere I could for kind of a knockoff recipe and then I played around with it and this is the recipe we've come up with. So here we go. We're going to start with two sticks of melted butter. We're going to throw it. This is the streusel portion. So the streusel will be going in the middle of the coffee cake as well as on the top. So got the melted butter. We're going to add to that two third cup of light brown sugar. Throw that in there. All of this kind of gets mixed up together, so it doesn't really matter order. So go ahead and mix that butter and brown sugar. After that, we're going to add two teaspoons of cinnamon. Get that all in there. And a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg. And a half a cup of regular white sugar. I mean, this is not for the faint of heart, I will tell you, but it's fantastic and it's worth it no matter what. All right, finally, we're gonna take two and two thirds cups of flour and add that. What this is gonna turn into is just a crumble. And like I said, it's gonna go in between on the coffee cake and on top of the coffee cake. Sometimes you can just throw your hands in here, although I haven't taken off my rings, so I will spare you from me doing that. There we go. All right, see, it's turned into a crumble, and because of all the butter, and it's just, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Okay, we have finished our crumble. Now we're going to do the batter. Before then, I've gone ahead and I have preheated the oven at 350. You need to make sure that it's done. Then we've got a bunt pan. We're gonna go ahead and grease that. Um, just I just spray some Pam on it, but you just don't want it to stick because you have to flip it at the end. So we've got that ready and here goes the batter. Oh my gosh, this is so good. All right, we're gonna take one and a half sticks of butter and we're gonna combine that with one and a half cups of sugar. Now, it's important that you whip this butter and this sugar for four to five minutes. We're gonna make it a little shorter, given that we're doing this for TV, but it needs to be light and airy so that your coffee cake really rises. All right, after those are mixed, and again, you're gonna do that longer than I did. You're gonna take four eggs that are at room temperature. Look at the size of that egg. I think that's a double yolk. It's a double yolk. I know, it's amazing. They're so beautiful. All right, we're gonna take four eggs. I'm not gonna use the duck. Well, let's use it. It's a double yolk. I feel like that's good luck or something. So here's a question I'm just thinking about while we do this. Does a Double yolk egg equal two eggs. I don't know. I'm going to do it as two eggs just because the whole size is bigger. All right, we're going to mix those four eggs. Get that all mixed in. And here we're going to add two teaspoons of vanilla. Get that all mixed up. I know, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. First, we're gonna do our sour cream. We do one and a third cups of sour cream. Let's get this in here. I mean, sour cream makes everything moist. I love sour cream in my cakes, in the coffee cake. All right, here we go. I'll tell you, I am not an exact baker. Probably would not have passed a baking course. <laughs> Uh, all right, here we go. Sour cream is done. Mix that up. All 
All right, to that, here we go. We are gonna add two teaspoons of baking powder. Put that in there. A half a teaspoon of baking soda. One teaspoon of kosher salt. Let's mix all of that up. And then you add the flour. And the flour, let's see, is two and a half cups of all-purpose flour. It is ready. Oh my gosh. I mean, who fights for these? I fight for these. Let's mix this. Here comes the fun part, the assembly. And I'm gonna spray just a little bit more. Make sure you spray the whole thing of your bunt pan because it has to come out and then flip over. We are now going to put half of the butter down, I mean batter, down in here. This coffee cake is so good. First of all, I make this coffee cake basically for all brunches that I cook for. Christmas, Thanksgiving, I serve it with quiche, I serve it with scrambled eggs. And like I said, even my kids have chosen it over a regular cake occasionally. So we've got half of the batter down. And let me show you what you do next. This is how you get it in the middle. You take the crumble that you've already done and you crumble it all around. Take half of this. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Then you're gonna take the remainder of this batter and put it all the way around. Let's see. Oh my gosh, your kids, your family, everybody's gonna thank you. You're gonna thank me. Have this with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee in the morning, just rewarm it if you want. We are gonna put the rest of the topping on top. This is then gonna go in your oven for about 40 to 50 minutes. I check on it and I touch it because I don't want it totally solid. There's a reason they call my food barely baked and that's because I really like things to be moist and I don't like things overcooked. But 40 to 50 minutes you should be good depending on your oven. All right. Let's put this in the oven. Okay, we've got the coffee cake in the oven. Now we're gonna get started on the quiche, which is one of my very favorite things. Probably because we eat so many eggs and I love eggs. But it also has a great story behind it. Um, we have a French bakery nearby and I typically don't love quiches. But this bakery, they are amazing and they're thick and, it's, and the crust is incredible. So I asked the baker one day, I said, what's your, what's your secret? So she gave me a couple of tips, which I'll share. And then the crust, I think it's really important if you can to make the crust. I've already made this crust, but again, it's in my cookbook. It's called a very English crust. And the reason it's called that is one of my very dear friends years ago, this older woman who has since passed, was a caterer in the area. And before she died, she gave me some of her recipes and one of them was her English crust. I call it the English crust. But I use it for both quiches as well as pies. And what I love about it, it's so easy to make. I'll make them in advance, I'll make them into balls and put them in freezer bags and freeze them in my freezer and pull them out as I need them so you're not having to make them all the time. I literally right now have four or five crusts in balls in my freezer. So I hope that's a good hint for you because otherwise it just gets too hard. You're like, I can't make a crust. You can, it'll take you 15 minutes, throw them in your freezer. So we've got the crust made ahead of time and we're gonna start with the inside. Here we go, so it calls for eight eggs. Here we go. 
Now, I don't know if you know the secret, how many of you get shells when you're cracking eggs and you chase it with your finger all the way around and you can't get it out? So maybe it's because I have chickens, but I've learned the way to do it. If you get a shell in your eggs, what you do, take a piece of your shell. There's a membrane in here. Stick it down there. It will draw that shell in here and you just scoop it out. It's really amazing. Anyway, it's one of my favorite little tips of having eggs. All right, here we go. All right, we've got eight eggs. After the eggs, you're going to take sour cream. Um, I think this is what makes it really rich. You have a couple of options. You can do heavy cream or sour cream or a mix, an equal mix of both. Today I'm gonna do a little mix, I think. So going ahead and doing two cups. It's not very attractive looking. And put another cup in here. Funny little story. I was getting ready to do this segment. I had all my ingredients in the fridge and I go to get the sour cream out and my daughter had taken it to go make breakfast at a friend's house. <laughs> So it caused a little bit of a delay. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna add heavy cream. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix this up and then add the rest of the stuff. All right. I like to use kosher salt, a teaspoon of that. and a half a teaspoon of pepper. Kind of looks like a half, right? And then we're gonna take a pinch of nutmeg. I don't know why, but the nutmeg really is nice in it. All right, a pinch of nutmeg. And go ahead and really mix this up. We are almost done. Now we bring in the crust. This was one of the secrets they told me. Take, here we go, about a, half, a cup and a half of cheese. I can kind of eye that. Cup and a half of cheese, coat the whole bottom. And I think this is one of the things I love about it. I'm doing a cheese quiche. If I wanted to do, I could do a basil quiche. I could do quiche Lorraine. Play around with this, add basil, add different kinds of cheeses, add goat cheese. Um, add some meats, add ham. It's the basic, the basic recipes here and you get to play and have fun with it. My favorite kind of cheese to use on this is that it's a sharp cheddar. It just gives a little bit of a kick. Then we're gonna stick it in the oven at 375 degrees for about, I mean, depending on your oven, I have one oven that's temperamental, one that works great, but look at it between 50 minutes and an hour and see if it's done. Sometimes about 15 minutes before it's done, I'll put tin foil over the top just so that the crust doesn't get too baked. So we're gonna put it in the oven. Okay, one of the things I love about holidays is you get family coming into town or friends that you haven't seen in a while. One of those people is my brother, and I'm excited to have him come do the bacon with me. John, where are you? Coming. My brother Jonathan's in town visiting from Denver, and I'm putting him to work in the kitchen. You know what I've loved, and I think because our kitchen is the center of our house, people are always going in and out, and they're part of the process. It's not like food magically appears. They are in here and they're helping and that's what makes it all fun. So Jonathan, I'm gonna put you to work. Got it. All right, here's what I need you to do. We've cut the bacon, you have thick cut bacon. I've cut it in half, it just, it's just easier to manage when it's in half. I'm gonna put it here. You're gonna take the bacon. What we've got here is a third of a cup of maple syrup. We're gonna put that, you wanna put the maple okay. syrup in there. In this bowl, we're gonna put a half a cup of brown sugar. We're gonna put a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. I think it just gives it a little bit of kick. And then we're gonna do 
a teaspoon of coarsely ground pepper, which I have right here. Now, we're gonna mix that up with our fingers. You wanna go ahead Got and mix it. that up with your fingers? Jonathan loves to cook, so it's kind of fun to have him doing this. Now, what I've prepared is a pan. Take a large cookie sheet, cover it in tin foil, and then take a cookie, you know, one of those cookie, um, what are they called? Cookie trays where you cool your cookies? Okay, full disclosure, somebody has taken my cookie thing, so I'm using the rungs that are inside the oven. But what it does is when we lay the bacon, it allows the fat to drop through onto your tin foil and not mess with your bacon. You got that all mixed up? Good to go. So what you're gonna do is you're going to dip bacon, both sides into the honey, and then lay it down onto the rack. We are going to then sprinkle with this stuff, if that got makes it. any sense. Um, Jonathan, you know, it's so much fun to have somebody here who's been a part of ev most every Easter of our lives. I think our mother started a tradition when she, I was probably five or six, and she started something what we call the hunt. It is now almost 50 years later. I think it'll be 50 years in the next couple of years. This hunt has taken place, I think 50 years this year or next year. This hunt takes place has taken place all over the country. We've done it, and get me if I'm missing anything, we've done the hunt on capital grounds in states. We've done them in amusement parks, zoos, museums, yep. huge areas in flower shows. We've done them everywhere. And what my mom started to do, my mom understood the importance of memory making and bringing people together. And so she did all these riddles. The whole family would gather, you'd get your riddle and you'd go to the next riddle on and on all day until you reached your treasure. That tradition has multiplied that by, I mean, we've had 60, 70 people do this before. People have come all from all over the country to participate in the hunt. And my mom passed away 17 years ago and my oh, dad wow. yeah, took up the long. mantle and my dad started doing it himself. Um, my kids, if you ask them one of their favorite holidays, Easter is it. You know, I think we already get together with our family and friends on Easter, but this makes it an experience together, which anyone who knows me knows I'm all about memory making. And I'm telling you, so how this happens is we all get together in the morning on Saturday, the day before Easter. Somebody, my dad or, you know, usually, now Jonathan has helped him, but he goes to the location ahead of time. He goes probably up to two weeks beforehand for two to three days thinking through riddles. He then comes back, we're divided into teams. We've even had like handkerchiefs that are different colors that tell which team you're on. Um, and you always start out with some sort of activity to determine which team gets to go first. You can't have everyone go into the Philadelphia Art Museum at the same time. So we've done everything from ch chasing and catching chickens, yep. three-legged races. There, I got it. Um, thank you. Um, here, let me move these all together. I'm forgetting my job. Um, <laughs> so you get there. Whoever comes in first place gets to go in first, and the race starts. This lasts until the final treasure is found. The treasure has been in the ocean. It's been in the middle of lakes. It's been in fireplace stacks. It's, it's been everywhere. And again, it's one of our very favorite family traditions. Um, and it's, it's an experience that nobody forgets. I mean, there are friends that have come decades ago that still talk about it. So the treasure is, first of all, every team has to contribute like 10 or $20. So the first person who sees the treasure actually gets to win the money. The treasure is just a huge black bag of every kind of candy, <laughs> granola bar, I mean, it's junk, it's gum, it's, it, but the point is, is you have spent all day trying to find the treasure. And then we all go out for a huge Mexican feast and margaritas and we just have a wonderful night. And ordinarily the next day on Easter, you know, we, my dad does a service often because we're all here together and we have a huge Easter brunch, which is what we're preparing for you today. So in this particular recipe, what I've given, it's a pound of bacon. But I'm doing about three of these, depending on the number that come, but we're a family that loves bacon. So I'm doing actually some regular bacon as well as candied, so I make sure I please everybody. 
All right, we're almost done that. And we're gonna take this mixture, which again has that cayenne pepper and regular pepper and brown sugar. And we are going to just kind of drizzle it. You wanna go wash your hands, are you good? You can just stick it yeah. in here. We're gonna drizzle it over everything. It just gets crispy and it's sweet and it's bacony and it's got a hot a little bit of heat to it. It's fun to do something different. I mean, I know you can all go get the spiral ham at the grocery store, but this is kind of just a fun, bring your kids in. I mean, you can have a two-year-old do this. For them to get their fingers in this is really a lot of fun. So today we're doing quiche, okay. co coffee cake. This, big berries with maybe some coconut yogurt and granola. You like everything. I do. Um, but you had to go a bit gluten-free, so you might be not doing my, my coffee cake. <laughs> no, but I do remember the coffee cake, and I love the coffee cake. Uh, I am a big berry guy, so um, anything Ruth makes with berries, I absolutely love. So I'm looking forward to that. This is going to go in the oven at 350 for 40 to 50 minutes until it's crispy. And you know, initially I was like, why do we put it in for so long when I can do it at 450 degrees and do it fast? It's because you don't want the sugar and to, to get too dark. If you put it on a high heat, that sugar is gonna cook so fast and blacken, and that's not what you want. So 350 degrees, 40 to 50 minutes, you want it nice and crispy, All right? Gotcha. Well, it's not ready yet. Not ready? No, because the quiche is in there. This will go in the oven as soon as the quiche is out. You know, Easter is that time where we're leaving winter and we're starting spring. All things are new. It's a great opportunity to draw your friends and your family together and to celebrate what Easter is really all about. And then in the process to make new memories. You know, our hunt has lasted almost 50 years. And for those who have participated, it is a memory they will never forget. They talk about it every time we're together. They've come from all over the country to participate. And you can do something as big as that or as small as the egg hunt in your yard. But I encourage you to do something. And so many cities now even have scavenger hunts that you can find on the computer to help you. It doesn't have to be you coming up with the riddles. So the other reason, and, and you remember this, you know, my mom died, um, who started that hunt, died almost 20 years ago, and she was in her 50s. And um, one of the gifts I was given, and this is one of the reasons I think Easter has become really important to me, it honored her, she started the hunt, but somebody gave me a hundred daffodil bulbs at her death. And I thought, why are you giving me daffodil bulbs? They don't come up until Easter, and she died in September. And the card the person sent me, I will never forget this, they said, you know what? We want you to remember every Easter, um, our faith believes that's the resurrection. Your mom, we believe, is in heaven. And when you see those daffodil bulbs come up at Easter, you're to remember that every year. Every year, every home we've moved to and redone, we have planted those hundred daffodil bulbs. So just know this is a special time of year. Celebrate with your family and God bless all of you. Once you experience the hunt, it is something that is second to none. Um, it's just an incredible experience. It, it brings out the creativity of the, um, the riddles. It brings out the competitiveness in our in us to but how you know, do you, you try to did you did you do that as a child no what we did you know we did what was the traditional uh when you're little kids is having the easter egg hunt in the backyard um and but nothing taking it to a uh, the next level of just bringing large gatherings of people together and like bruce said it doesn't need to be large gatherings it can be just your intimate family and how do you create something fun and creative in that way. And something that happens year after year. I think Bob started doing the hunt when we were dating. Yes. And I mean, that was one of your first, that was be right before my mom died. So you got to experience that. And it's been fun since dad has taken over and does all of the. Right. Yeah, because your mom was leading the hunt and her 
brain doesn't work the same as mine, so <laughs> it led to a lot of frustrations with the riddles going. Her riddles are crazy. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I don't think that way. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother was a creative, and and her, it, they would rhyme, and it'd be poetic, and we would be sitting there going, "What the heck is that?" <laughs> so, so yeah, but, but it's no, been fun. but it's been an amazing experience, and what I love about it too is. Uh, my kids are so involved with it. Uh, even when they are one or three or five, we are pushing strollers around, um, jogging strollers, and running as fast as we can with the kids in tow. And they're part of the experience. And they make it a part of it uh, that the riddles are never hidden above cer a certain height so the kids can find actually the next riddle or the next clue. So it's really intentional with making sure that everybody is involved. I think what's been fun too, and I don't want to interrupt you, is someone who's two years old can enjoy it as much as somebody who's 80. There was one time we were going to be doing the Art Museum of Philadelphia, and the contest before was to run the Rocky Steps. And my uncle, who was probably 85 at the time, mm -hmm. was racing on one of the teams, and his daughter took a tumble down the stairs. She was my age. And he ran past her and was like, hope you're doing okay, and just kept on going. <laughs> so I love that everyone participates, and it's just, it's a memory-making opportunity. So that's what I encourage you, Homeworthy, and thank you again so much for celebrating with our family. I get asked all the time what I put on my island, and I love to bring the outside in, and I love fresh herbs year-round, even if I can't grow them because it's winter. So get a fun container. This was bought, it was given to me by a friend. She bought it at an antique store. I think it's like a mug of some kind. And then I throw in parsley and basil. I've got a cup of water in there, and uh, I can use it for cooking at any time. So just any kind of wooden, you can fill this with little tomatoes. I have avocados. And again, I usually squeeze a lemon every night into a hot drink, so I love my lemons. But this brings me to Scotty. Scotty is my third daughter, and she's incredibly good at all things calligraphy. She's the one who's calligraphied inside of the barn. And I thought, I was trying to figure out how can I do name cards, place cards for the table we're gonna be sitting at and I thought it would be fun to do it on our fresh eggs. So, if you wanna try something like this, get an egg. They're not hard boiled. You can't really hard boil fresh eggs. I mean, you could hard boil it, but you wouldn't be able to get the shells off. That membrane needs time to separate. So, we're gonna go ahead and do these fresh so I can use them later in scrambled eggs. And what she is doing, make sure it's dry and at room temperature, because they're fresh, they can be at room temperature and she is writing each person's name. This is Audrey. And you'll see when we go into the barn how we're gonna set the table with these eggs. Thank you, sweetie. When did you learn how to calligraphy? Um, I don't know, actually, I have no idea. I've kind of always known how to do it. She's always the one that writes beautiful. And in fact, in my cookbook, a lot of the fun little vignettes were written by Scotty when she was younger. Okay, the coffee cake is ready to be taken out. Let's go. My goodness, this is gorgeous. All right. And it'll be warm when it's served later. It's piping hot right now. I would not flip it right now. Um, I'd give it a couple of hours and let it get a little bit of cool, otherwise it'll just fall apart. So we're gonna let this cool, we're gonna be eating in a couple of hours and we'll flip it right before then. The quiche is still cooking, the bacon's getting ready to go in. I think it's time to go down to the barn and do our centerpiece for the table. Let's go. 
All right, it's time to go down to the barn. Gosh, it's sunny out here. And we've got the eggs that my daughter did all of the calligraphy for the tablescape. But before we go is my very favorite place. It's the herb garden. And if you look closely, things are starting to come up. You can tell winter's leaving and spring is coming. And we'll be doing this garden pretty soon on another episode. But my husband made each one of these by hand and prepared kind of a garden right outside of my door. All right, to the barn we go. Oh my goodness, can today be any more spectacular? And what I'm excited, we're doing something completely different in the barn. Usually we have a long table that goes the full length that seats 32. And I thought since we're only having 12 people, it would be fun to create a square. So that's what I've done. I've put all three tables together and, and we have a perfect square. So now we're gonna put the flowers together. We'll make the bouquet in the very center. So I'm very fortunate. One of the great things about having a lot of girls, and it's not that my son doesn't help, but my girls know exactly what I need when we're gonna throw a party or do something fun like today. So they've already prepared everything for me and they'll come later when we're gonna set the table. But I wanna tell you kind of what we're gonna use on the table. First of all, I love color, especially, I mean, spring is here. It's the time for color. And we were, I have family that lives in Park City and there's something called the High West Distillery and I thought these bottles were beautiful. So I'm gonna fill these with water. They'll go on the table to serve water. I borrowed from a friend who has really fun antique glassware. I just asked her if I could have some 12, they're not all matching, but just glassware that I'm gonna put a special little drink in. And then I always use a fun placemat. I love these. Again, they just remind me of spring. All right, so the first thing we're gonna start in this barn is the centerpiece. And you can really complicate a centerpiece. I love to create bouquets of a single type of flower, but lots, it just has, there's, it's simple and elegant and beautiful. And I thought, I mean, what represents spring more than tulips? So since I don't have any tulips growing yet, the place I always get my tulips are at Trader Joe's, I have to confess. But here's what you're going to do. Pull out your tulips. You're gonna determine how long you want by choosing your vase. When I was trying to prepare for this, I went over and over what kind of vase, what would be the right height given how big my table was. And actually what we've chosen to do is I've put this, it's a wooden, um, kind of a wooden step thing. I don't know another word for it. That we're gonna set this on and it's just gonna elevate it a little bit. But I decided since I'm having a square table to use this vase, which is a little round, it's just a little bit of a contrast. Inside of it, I put a bowl of water. Now, how do you do tulips? First of all, you're gonna wanna get rid of the leaves that are at the very bottom because they're gonna rot in water and it just you just don't need those. Go ahead, take those off. You're gonna cut all of your tulips at an angle on the base. That gets them the most water. And can I just tell you, I think these are the greatest shears of all time. I had a friend give them to me. They, I mean, precision and amazing. And I've had them for years. I was trying to look up the name of it. If you look up Japanese shears, these are gonna come up. I can't pronounce the name for you, but these are fantastic. All right, getting back to the flowers. So cut all of them, same, same length, same distance. And then we're going to fill this so that it's cascading, so that it just fills the whole center of the table. Tulips are also beautiful to do in a clear glass. I just didn't have one big enough to do what I wanted to do. You can also do something called using a frog. I did this the other day. I had never used a frog, um, but a friend of mine loaned me hers. I'm going to take them out of these flowers right here. It's called a frog and it will, it's kind of, I guess, instead of an oasis, but you can stick your flowers so that they stand up. I'm not wanting mine to stand up in this particular thing because I want it to cascade. It's also important to change your water every day. They drink, I mean, they drink a lot of water.
It's fun. I've even used outdoor containers. You know, your big black urns that you use outside? I've used those inside as a centerpiece of a table. Well, at least where I live in Pennsylvania, we don't have any flowers yet. So I go to my one of my very favorite places to get flowers. I mean, it's Trader Joe's. It's one of my secrets. Um, actually, I do a lot of fun, of the, fun tips like this on my Instagram, which is Hungry for Home. And on Tuesdays, I do something called Tip Tuesday. And I just try to tell, you know, little tips, household tips, cooking tips, gardening tips. And that was one of them. I get a lot of my things at Trader Joe's for this. You know, you do anything. <laughs> Okay, doesn't this look amazing? I just need to make sure from every direction it's even, but I mean, oh my gosh. This makes me think of Easter. Even just flowers can transform a table and just create a mood. So I love it, I love it. The height, you have to figure out your height when you're determining your table, but I think this is gonna work perfectly. I mentioned before I had to run up to the house to see if the quiche was ready and the quiche is ready. So I think I also said sometimes I have to put a tin foil on it so the crust doesn't get too cooked. I mean look how beautiful. Gosh that's gorgeous. Okay, so I thought it'd be fun to come up with a really interesting, different way to do, you know, place cards. So, as I said earlier, Scotty wrote names on each of the different colored eggs. And here's what I'm going to have everyone do. You take, I'm using a white linen napkin, and then you roll it like this. And we're gonna turn it like this, so it's almost like two rabbit ears. And take a piece of this Rafa, Rafio, I don't know, Rafa, I'm not sure what it's called. But you can get it at any craft store. In fact, I went at 8 o'clock last night. Take this Rafa, tie it right here. So there's a small hole. You can tie a bow, you can tie a knot. I'll probably tie a bow. or you could just cut it short. Here we got this, and I'm going to take an egg. This one's Audrey's, and I'm gonna set the egg right here in the hole. So, little bunny ears, and the egg is like there, and we will set it from there. I've called in the troops, I've called in all the kids, and everyone's gonna come help set the table. <music> Okay, I've talked about before a lot of color on the table, especially for Easter and spring. So I'm grabbing some raspberries, throwing them into each one of the fancier glasses. And you can do a Prosecco, you can do, I'm going to do a sparkling pink lemonade. It just adds just one more element of color. And then I'm gonna cut some lemons for the water glasses.
All right. Happy Easter, everybody. And thank you for coming. And thank you for celebrating Jesus' resurrection with us. So thank you. Love family and friends. So, Lord, thank you for this food. Bless it to our bodies. And thank you. Just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, everyone, sit down. Let's eat. They are not hard boiled. Hey, Charlotte, they're hard boiled. Try it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.